I'm Professor David Wilson. As a criminologist, I'm often asked, what's it like to interview a murderer? This is a tape-recorded interview. The date is 11 17 of to answer this question, I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark heart of the police interrogation room. Using cutting edge lip sync technology, we'll bring to life the actual tape confessions of some of the world's most notorious killers. I put tape on her mouth, tell her that's what she can bring. And bring you face to face with evil. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And along with forensic psychologist, Professor Michael Brooks, I'll analyze their interviews in unparalleled detail. Her skull gave way a little bit. She was there immediately unconscious. Their wicked words, now seen spoken for the very first time, will never be forgotten. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. In today's episode, we feature the police interviews of not one, but two killers. They were a boyfriend and girlfriend who shared dark sexual fantasies involving the abduction of young teenage girls. They killed as part of a folie à deux, a joint madness, compelling them to become partners in crime. Such killing couples often have a shared sadism with perhaps Fred and Rose West and Brady and Hindley being the most infamous murderers falling into this category. The victim of the pair under scrutiny today was Bristol schoolgirl Rebecca Watts, who disappeared in February 2015. Initial inquiries focused on the belief that Becky had disappeared after leaving the family home, based on statements given by her stepbrother and his girlfriend who were in the house at the time. They said they had not seen Watts, but had heard the door slam and assumed she'd left in a teenage tantrum. Suspicious about their story, the police brought the pair in for questioning separately. Over the course of two days, their stories shift and change. The male, as the dominant killing partner, tries to protect the female and absolve her for any blame, even refusing to have her name mentioned. However, as their stories unravel, their loyalties are challenged, culminating with the bombshell discovery of Becky's dismembered body. She'd been cut into pieces and placed in a suitcase. It's a fascinating series of interviews demonstrating how killers will do anything to avoid confronting the realities of their crimes. Who were these young lovers who ended a life in order to satisfy their shared sexual fantasies? Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare. In February 2015, two Bristol teenagers were brought into Patchway Police Station for questioning. A 15-year-old schoolgirl called Becky Watts had gone missing. Police believed her stepbrother, Nathan Matthews, was the last person to have seen her. A statement Matthews had given at the time of the disappearance, when the police visited the home the family shared, didn't add up. He was about to be questioned under caution. What would unfold 
over the next few days. This interview is being um, recorded at uh, Patchway Police Station in Bristol. It is now Tuesday the 3rd of March 2015 and it's exactly 12 midday. Um, I'm DC 3302, Marie Stephen. Nathan, can you give us your full name? Nathan Charles Matthews. Thank you. And your date of birth? The 9th of the 1st, 1987. One of the things when you're looking at a killer, or a serial killer in particular, when you start looking back into their lives, one of the things you identify as a common trait is dysfunctional family background. There's always been some kind of trauma, or there's been absent parents, there's been divorces, there's been new families joined together, forced together collectively, because two adults have decided to join those families together. So the children are sort of left there in limbo and they're trying to obviously get on with the new brothers and stepbrothers and sisters as best they can. Nathan Matthews, his mother married Becky's father and Becky lived with her father and Nathan's mother at a home not far from where he grew up. At the beginning, uh, it would appear that Nathan was very supportive towards the family and got on well with her. But there does seem to be um, suggestions of some sexual misbehaviour on his part towards her. He seems to have developed a bit of a resentment towards Becky. And, I mean, you wonder whether that was down to the fact that she wasn't compliant in his sort of world. She didn't sort of kowtow to him in any way. She didn't want to play any of his games. She didn't enjoy it when he jumped out to frighten her, perhaps. And maybe this is one of the reasons that he, he could never quite dominate her and manipulate her and maybe that was why he, he really didn't like her at all. Shauna Hoare had been with Nathan Matthews for six years but it was a troubled relationship born out of troubled personal circumstances. She um, had a very disturbed childhood. Uh, she was one of eight children, she was put in care for uh, her own protection. She, at some stage in her life, returned to, the, to her mother. And then, at the age of about 14 or 15, she met Nathan, who became her boyfriend. Now, he is a 20-year-old man, she's a 14-year-old girl. So she's very naive, innocent. He teaches her about sex, and they get into sex in a big way. It would appear that Shauna um, actually seemed to encourage him and engage him in the, his fantasies. They started getting into sexual fantasies, they started getting into threesomes, they started to look at the more deviant end of the sexual um, continuum. As their fantasies evolved um, and their communication and the way they talked about what they would like to do and so on um, became more finely tuned and clearer, then you, uh, you get to a point where the fantasy isn't enough anymore and so the pleasure then has to move to reality. And, and if you've got two people who are reinforcing each other's behaviour, then that step can be taken, I think, m more easily perhaps than somebody who's acting alone. They start talking about kidnapping uh, Becky. Now, a lot of people have fantasies and they share it with their partner but there's an element of control. They know it's fantasy, it's not the real world. He has gone past that point and is actually starting to plan it as a serious act. Um, at the beginning, there doesn't seem to be any suggestion of, of homicide, but later on, uh, Nathan actually acquires a, a kind of murder kit. He calls it a kidnap kit. Um, handcuffs, ropes, things like that, and clearly, to be used to kidnap her. Becky was reported missing by her father originally. He hadn't seen his daughter and Shauna and Nathan had claimed that on the day of her disappearance, they had heard the door slam, but they hadn't seen her leave. So there was kind of this version of events that Becky had gone out of the house and she had just disappeared into thin air. But when police took a look at her belongings, they found 
that she didn't have her mobile phone, she didn't have her laptop, her social media was inactive. And that's really unusual for a young teenage girl to not be posting on Facebook every few hours. And actually after a few days, it became really clear that Becky had disappeared. I didn't particularly talk to her, but obviously I don't particularly like her. And obviously what annoys me is the way she speaks to like my mum sometimes. Yeah. She'd be kind of like rude or whatever. What we're most interested in is finding Becky. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what the police want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, what can you tonight tell us about Becky's disappearance? And then, like, what, what do you want to know? We want to like, find her. Where is she? I don't know where she is. Is she safe? Well, I don't know where she is, so I'm not to know. Do you know she's alive? Well, no. <laughs> Have you hurt her? No, I haven't hurt her. With Nathan rested from his initial round of questions, Shauna Hoare was now brought in to also be questioned under caution in relation to the disappearance of Becky Watts. This interview is being digitally recorded at Patchwood Police Station in Bristol. Um, can you tell us your full name, please? Shauna Stacey Charmaine Hoare. Uh, has Nathan had any sort of concerns about speaking to us? Not that he's told me now. If he does, I wouldn't know then. Mm. Yeah. How, how is he finding it? Um, he's found it quite hard, actually. Yeah. yeah. Or again, knowing how hard it'd be for his mum at the moment. You know, because Becky was almost like her daughter, a daughter to her. Is there anything going on in that house that made you worried? No. Or concerned? No. Everything seemed normal. Is there anything that happened that could be significant in the disappearance of Rebecca? No. Are you absolutely sure? Yes. Well, the interviews end up being quite revealing because, uh, first of all, you know, you, you have Shona, who's very kind of articulate, uh, talkative, but absolutely unconcerned about Becky's disappearance. She sort of giggles a bit and laughs a bit and makes asides, but there's no sense of distress or, or concern about the, the missing teen. Um, and Nathan is, is, is pretty similar. He's very sort of controlled. He's very, you know, um, very confident in, in the way he's talking. Could we use a key from underneath the recycling bin? Got in. Um, heard music upstairs. Assume Becky had been in then. Mm. Um, I went into the kitchen to get a cigarette and went to go outside to have a cigarette. My daughter started whinging because she wanted to come up with me, so I took her down to the garden to help feed the rabbit while I had a cigarette. And she asked me if Becky had gone out, and I said, Yeah, I heard the door go. Immediately before this sound of the door slamming, what could you hear then? I heard stomping downstairs. That's what made me think that Becky left in a mood. I assumed, you know, she was in a bit of one of her tantrums. <laughs> yeah. The strange thing was that their story slotted together so perfectly. And sometimes when police will interrogate people, there'll be overlaps or there'll be bits of misinformation that just generally happen from interviewing witnesses and people that are in a pressurised situation but Shauna and Nathan had stories so exact, it seemed really obscure to the investigators. I'm here with Professor Michael Brooks, a man who spent the majority of his professional life talking to prisoners in his role as a prison psychologist. How is he finding it? Um, he's found it quite hard, actually. Okay, it's the start of the interview. What's interesting, of course, it's one of those two-handers. Um, Shauna Hoare is being interviewed separately from Nathan Matthews about Becky Watts's murder. And they're both asked roughly the same question. Is there any reason why you wouldn't get on uh, with Becky? 
and of course they come up with something anodyne about uh, Becky leaves her clothes lying about the floor and is therefore showing disrespect to, um, to their mother. And that may well be the case because the motivating factor behind um, killing Becky may not have been domestic circumstances. There may have been um, other reasons, particularly sort of sexual deviancy on the part of uh, Nathan and Shauna. And that was the, the contributor factor which caused to them um, killing Becky. And so if there's nothing in the home circumstances, we're on to the, uh, what might be sexually driving their behavior. Nathan Matthews is seven years older than Shauna. Indeed, he meets Shauna when she's just 14. He clearly is sexually attracted to younger women. And clearly Becky Watts, his stepsister, fits the age range that he's interested in. And there must have been some pre-planning about, they both knew they were going to be taken down the police station. They both knew that they were going to be interviewed about what happened to Becky. They must have discussed that with each other and come up with some tactics that eventually are going to unravel, but they must have discussed that prior to going to the police station. Well, they may have done, but once you're in that police station and separated, then there's a whole set of different dynamics that come into play. While Shauna is being interviewed, the pressure begins to get to Nathan, and he wants to give another statement, this time written. This is a technique used by the police. They separate suspected accomplices to a crime, and the knowledge that their partner is being interviewed, and perhaps telling the truth, is a catalyst for the other to change their story. I had developed an idea to scare Rebecca by kidnapping her. I wanted to kidnap her to teach her a lesson. During a short struggle, my mask slipped and Rebecca was able to see my face. This caused me to panic and I strangled her. Very helpfully, um, we've been provided with a prepared written statement. And what we would like to do now, Nathan, is for that to be told on the interview recorded. Do I have to actually listen to it and I put my fingers in my ears? Armed with Nathan's new statement, the detectives question Shauna again. He says that he killed Becky whilst he was at the address on the state. Okay. What's your knowledge of him killing Becky? I found out yesterday morning. You found out yesterday morning? Um, prior to that, I had no idea that he had any involvement in anything at all. How do we know you weren't involved in the, the killing of Becky? Because there would be no proof. Mm -hmm. I haven't touched anything or been anywhere near her alive or dead. Can you tell me then, Nathan, because if we work through what you told us in this written statement, this um, idea that you You're had... You was... Oh, I don't know. Are ways. you gonna have to? Are you gonna have to read that statement? No. I don't want that to be read to someone. <coughs> Once Nathan had made a statement to the police, and that was taken down in writing, and then when the police went back to him to re-interview him and read back the statement. He went into denial, and it's very typical of immature killers to want to do this, to go into denial. They don't want to hear the words, the foul deeds they've done. They've done it, they've told the police, that's it, gone. They just want to leave it. What strikes me on, on watching Matthew's behavior is here is a young man who is clearly out of his depth, and he is distraught, and he is um, physically doubled over in, uh, He's tearful, he's making fragmentary statements. Uh, his behavior is someone who cannot cope. He has failed to cope completely in this situation. He doesn't know what to do. He does not have the skills necessary to even respond coherently. I don't want that to be read to someone. What do you make of that? So this is the bit where fantasy moves to reality. Mm -hmm. 
and the difficulty of coping then with reality. And that's the bit where it starts becoming emotionally disturbing to him, realising what he did. And the beginning when he's holding his hands over his ears, he literally doesn't want to hear the information. It's too much for him. And yet he's the one that is older than Shauna Hoare. He's the one that would be the dominant, do you think? Well, we have to start working through, well, what was the fantasy? Who, who, and who was responsible for enacting the, 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 the fantasy? Was it shared? Was it joint? Was it um, from, from Nathan? Was it from Shona? And those are things that you'd, you'd want to explore. But certainly that there is um, a vulnerability about him as well as a, a dominance. And sometimes that's quite often the case, that people may present with a very hard exterior, but actually underneath they're quite fragile. And so what you're finding now is the fragility of the individual coming out, even though he may well have been the dominant person and um, instigating the uh, attack and assault and uh, kidnap and, and, and murder. Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare have both now had an opportunity to present to the police their version of events regarding the disappearance of Becky Watts. Killing couples nearly always collude in the planning, execution and aftermath of their crimes to ensure that they get their story straight. However, the seasoned police officers interviewing them are already finding disparities that are of concern and other behavioural issues that raise suspicion. Matthews' refusal to hear his own written statement is classic denialist behaviour, as are his frequent histrionics and tears. Hoare's flat effect and nonchalance are extraordinary, and for me, she is the more controlled of the couple and the more dangerous for it, which perhaps also hints at who may have been the dominant partner in this killing couple. But as the interviews progress, it's the discovery of Becky's mutilated body that brings about a seismic shift in the interview room. Nathan's claims were that at home, Becky's attitudes towards Angie, his mother, had really started to get on his nerves, that she was ungrateful and that she was rude to her. And he said that what he had eventually concocted up was a way to teach her a lesson and to teach her to be a little bit more grateful towards the people in her life, particularly Angie. What he had decided he was going to do was he was going to scare her and he said all he had meant to do was to go into her room and he was going to get her to fold up into a suitcase and he would drive her out to the woods and tell her things like you should be more grateful for the people in your life and you should not treat people so badly and his claims were that he was going to leave her there and then when she came home she would hopefully be scared into behaving maybe a little bit better towards her family. How about if we start with this idea you had about scaring Becky. Tell me about how that started up then, how you got that idea. Well, I don't know if it was on TV or something like that, but obviously I had a couple of dreams. About the, the idea that you got, you said it might have been something on TV or you had a dream. And also I came up with the idea to scare her, because like to try and basically make her more appreciative mm -hmm. of life so she'd be more appreciative. Okay. So tell me what you thought you were going to do. What your plan was. Obviously stick her in the suitcase. Obviously, um, obviously put tape around her mouth so she wouldn't make any noise. Obviously, I, what, um, what the plan was obviously once I got her in the car to make up some up to say to, say to Shauna, um, obviously I had to leave like to help someone or do something or something up. I'll obviously like scare her and you know say some along the lines of you know you've got to start treating people um start treating people better you know not being a bitch. Oh, so I came up with the idea to scare her. Let's deal with the defense. Um he basically is suggesting that the plan was to 
kidnap and frighten Becky because of seemingly the disrespect that she shows to their mother by leaving her clothes about the floor and not picking them up and being tidy. The intention was never to kill her. The intention was to kidnap and frighten her. Do you buy that in any way, shape or form? Well, we have to remember that an interview is a process. So you start where the person is, and that is in sort of not accepting any, any sort of responsibility, saying actually they're, they're a nice, happy family, there's no reason why, why um, we should fall out with, um, with Becky, other than that she, she's disrespectful. And now you've moved it on slightly, or the interviewer's moved it on slightly, in which there, there's an acknowledgement of some things that happened, but they can't yet accept fully what's happened. And so that takes time to get there. We hear this so often of um, a killer trying to rationalise his behaviour by blaming the victim. We've got classic victim blaming here where he's saying that uh, Rebecca was in the house causing problems for his mother, um, causing family disputes and things like that. Still doesn't justify killing her. Um, if it's got any justification, it should have been the big brother and given her advice and everything else. Because she's a, a tiresome teenager. But we see time and time again, killers using uh, victim blaming techniques. Has he ever said he's interested in kidnapping anyone or have you seen him go on any websites or anything at all? Or, I mean, where has this come from? I have no idea, but he's never mentioned kidnapping somebody or killing so again I'm not sure if he's just kind of lost his marbles or if deeply disturbed without anybody knowing. I suppose the question is why Becky? Again I knew they didn't you know. particularly like each other I wouldn't say they hated each other and yeah I didn't always like Becky but she was a nice enough girl she was so young I mean, kidnapping fantasies are all about control. It's about taking someone's liberty and having them entirely within your own control. You control, well, you control whether they live or die, ultimately. Um, and actually, kidnapping fantasies, especially in terms, in sexual, in terms of sexual violence, are, are really quite, quite common. Um, and it is about, it's about the objectification of the person who's been kidnapped is taking away their voice entirely and they just become a, a part in the offender's narrative. Perhaps, perhaps there's uh, an element uh, of truth in him um, not wishing to kill Becky, but um, perhaps there was a, a point at which he panicked and um, him wanting to render Becky unconscious, maybe, maybe he thought it would be better at that point to, to, um, to, to kill her. But really, I mean, th that's academic. Um, Nathan Matthews murdered Becky Watts. Um, that's, that's the end of it. The reality of what happened to Becky was much different. Becky was upstairs in her room. Nathan came in. There seems to have been some sort of a struggle. He had panicked and he had began to strangle her until she lost consciousness. He put her in his car and drove it to his home a few miles away and it seems as though something happened in the bathroom at Nathan's home because when police scanned it, it was immaculate. There was no DNA on the bathtub and the house was in this state of disarray. There was stuff everywhere, it was untidy, it was unclean. But when police looked at the bathtub, it was gleaming. There was no DNA of Shauna and there was no DNA of Nathan, let alone any DNA of Becky. And this just seemed really out of place to them. Now, Nathan um, had spent some time in the army himself. Um, and so he was very, very thorough 
in cleaning up the bathroom. This was him um, employing the decontamination skills that he had learned in the army. There's footage of him going into a DIY store and purchasing a circular saw, which ultimately he used to cut up and dismember Becky's body. He had now just got a body. This wasn't an individual, this wasn't Becky. This was somebody who no longer was a human being in his own mind. It was an object, which is completely and utterly wrong. But that, to his own mind, was what she was. That's what she'd become. And he needed to get rid of it. Now, for somebody to be able to sadistically do this and cut and dismember a body up, you have to be cold, you have to be calculating, and you have to be devoid of any emotion almost psychopathic, without any shadow of a doubt. They had cut her body up and put her into tiny packages. They had then roped friends in to holding on to these packages. And the friends knew they were holding on to something potentially illegal when they claimed they had no idea that what they were holding on to were actually Becky's remains. After they had killed her, apparently they, they got went out and got a meal and played some sort of song from a film about how do you dispose of a body. That, that, that shows a kind of disturbing level of cynical disregard, which is one of the characteristics of someone who has failed to develop a conscience. It took police 12 days before they eventually found Becky's remains. And when they found them, they found them discarded in a shed. Nathan Matthews capitulates under pressure and reveals the details of how Becky died. Yet he's still unable to admit to her murder. His appalling justifications for the crime, claiming it was his duty to scare her and teach her a lesson for disrespecting his mother, suggests a high level of resentment towards the young girl. However, once again, it's Hoare's interview that intrigues. Her continued attempts at deception and denial, even willing to use her unborn twin children as a pawn in the game she's playing with the police, suggests she was far more complicit in the crime and far more determined to save her own skin than her boyfriend Matthews. But the police evidence against the couple is stacking up and it's gradually being fed into the interview room. We have to investigate this whole offence and of course whilst you're being interviewed, Shauna is also uh, being no, interviewed. I know Shauna's being interviewed. Yeah. I'll talk about Shauna. So you don't want to? Okay. Oh, she said something about, um, something about Shauna. Can you rephrase it? Mm -hmm. So we can include basically everybody in it and not use her name. It's very difficult to understand the mechanics of their relationship because he, he does seem to want to keep her out of uh, culpability for this horrific crime. Um, maybe that's part of some deal that they had. Maybe he, he was, he was in awe of her, or he was, he was terrified that he would lose her affection. Um, but he really does try quite hard to keep her out of it, to the extent that he can't even bear to hear her name mentioned during the interview, which sort of seems quite extraordinary. Once the confession had been made, Shauna was relieved, and she just wanted to make sure that she was all right and her children were going to be all right. So she actually went forward and said, this was all Nathan's fault, I'm innocent, this has nothing to do with me, I'm just a victim as well, if you like. So she went into open flow, really, about Nathan's guilt to defend herself and protect herself. Just so I'm clear, as far as the kidnap's concerned, you are not aware that Nathan was planning to do that on no. that day? OK. How do I know that you weren't involved? Again, I shouldn't have any DNA reason to be involved in, again, especially with my past, to think that I could allow harm to come to somebody else like that is highly unlikely. And again, the fact that, as far as I knew, he was, you know, changing, he wasn't as violent anymore. 
<sighs> Take a moment, that's right. So. Um. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And the fact that we've got a little girl ourselves. I'm carrying his humble children. I felt sick knowing what he did. The idea that he then, because she begins to try and responsibilize him and downplay any part that she might have had in Becky's murder, and yet she's pregnant with his two unborn children. So, so what she's trying to say is that he's totally responsible for what happened and I'm not. She's very quick to kind of um, cut him loose, despite the fact that he um, has been trying fairly hard to sort of protect her, which kind of does suggest, in a way, that she was perhaps more proactive in the relationship than um, some people might think looking in. Although he he, he may have had paedophile tendencies and, and, and was a clearly sexually deviant character, what was her engagement in all this? I mean, she seems to be fairly proactive and fairly um, responsible for the dynamics there. What we have to do is look at the interaction, and it's quite complex. So, in some respects, in, in certain respects, they were probably both dominant, but what, what we need to look at is that what happens when they come together, and that destructive, um, you know, pair they made. So they really reinforced each other, and while in some elements, um, one may have been domin dom dominant over the other. I think it was the way they acted together, the way they reinforced each other's behaviour, the way they fueled each other. It was all about around negativity um, and, and um, you know, um, destructive um, sexual fantasies, and, and it was really just the perfect storm. They were they were the perfect couple in that respect. By this time, the police had gained access to the couple's phones. A number of messages shared between them shed new light on the dark nature of their relationship. So the first message is uh, 9th of 12th, 2014, uh, timed at 12.48, and it says to Shauna, and um, it says, F you bring me back to pretty schoolgirls then. D1, I think that says. Tell me about that text message. No comment. Next message is 9th of December 2014 at 18.14. It says from Shauna. Just went to cost cutters and saw a very in big cat's pretty pre petite girl. Almost knocked her out to bring her home. L-O-L. -L, and there's crosses and zeros. Shauna, what can you tell me about that? No comment. Am I right in thinking that this girl was similar to Becca's age? No comment. She's seen a 16-year-old girl outside the supermarket and sent a text message to Nathan saying, I've seen this girl outside the supermarket and I want to bash her on the head. And that in itself was incriminating. Thereafter, the police said to her, how can you justify or explain this? And suddenly she wasn't as talkative. Suddenly she went into no comment, no comment, no comment, and she wasn't helpful at all. Almost knocked her out to bring her home. Shauna, what can you tell me about that? No comment. Well, I, I think those clips give us quite a bit of information, don't they? They do. Uh, in, in terms of her engagement in the process, in terms of her wanting to um, pick up and sort of sexually abuse, to some extent, um, young girls, the, the extent um, to which it's going to be a joint enterprise between her and, and, and Nathan. And sort of on both sides, not wanting to comment any further, not to implicate themselves any further, given the information that the police already have. When a suspect has been very helpful in the police investigation and answering, answering all the interview questions and pointing them in the right direction and being open and honest and truthful as best they can, when they suddenly stop, when they're confronted with something that's not showing them in a good light, and start going no comment, 
that's when the alarm bells start to ring. And it's normally a classic sign of somebody's guilt. I think Shauna was certainly complicit in the planning of the abduction of Becky. Can you say whether Shauna wanted Becky dead? Um, I, I don't think, I don't think you can even say that Nathan wanted Becky dead. She's certainly responsible um, to a, a large degree for the death of Becky Watts. Protected by Nathan, Shauna continued to maintain that Nathan had acted independently of her and that she had no knowledge of the crime. Detectives, however, were convinced that she had been present and had been instrumental in the plan to harm Becky. As the interviews draw to a close and the evidence mounts, both Matthews and Hoare shift from being talkative and informative to silent and uncommunicative. They both turn into the classic no-comment killers. The evidence is insurmountable and their lies will be listened to no more. I've seen this happen time and time again. The police interviews would play a crucial role at their trials. Matthews would be found guilty of murder and Hoare the lesser charge of manslaughter. But anyone in any doubt about the role she played in the crime should consider the shocking text messages she exchanged with Matthews that were read out to her during the police interviews. They are a stark reminder that killing couples with shared fantasies will always continue to find each other and find a way to unleash their dark, sadistic passions. This is an illustration, I think, of the malignancy that can grow uh, from co-conspirators who um, begin to plot and who have a kind of moral vacuity. I think when you look at cases similar to this and you look at how a couple get together, how they are thrown together by the universe and they feed off each other's deviant behavior, they actually get a thrill from that. And it's almost like two worlds colliding. It's two minds looking at something in a very negative way, not a positive way, in a negative way that they want to fuel their own desires. So it's a bit narcissistic for the both of them, really. And that's what, what happened in this case. These particular people, these two people, were as bad as each other, there's no doubt about it. But ultimately, had they not been caught because they'd already tasted the kill, if you like, they'd reached that euphoria of, of killing and getting away with it if they had got away with it, undoubtedly they would have continued and there'd have been more victims. It's quite possible that she may have become a procurer for him and that it might have escalated and they may have had the victims if they had gotten away with this. And I don't know if that's the case. You could make the counter argument that Becky, he solved his problem by killing Becky. And I've often heard murderers effectively say that they had one victim that was a nemesis. Uh, when that person was killed, um, their problem was solved. Simple as that. Um, I think I tend to subscribe to more to that than any other more um, malignant uh, potential. And yeah, I didn't always like Becky, but she was a nice enough girl. So the idea that somehow Women ca are always nurturing and caring, and men are always sadistic and brutal. These are caricatures of gender. Well, it becomes much more complex in these, these joint relationships if we take Ian Brady and Mara Hindley, if we take Fred and Rose West, um, in, in which the women become actively engaged in the process. Whatever it started off, um, th th they sort of get assumed within it and become active players. Whenever I'm asked that, I know that the next question should be, if Myra Hindley had never met Ian Brady, if Rose West had never married Fred West, if Shauna Hoare had never met Nathan Matthews, would any of those women have ended up 
committing murder. And that we will never know. The murder of Becky Watts remains one of the most chilling and senseless in recent memory. The police interviews of Nathan Matthews and Shauna Hoare are a prime example of how excellent police work and interrogation techniques leads to the truth, no matter how solid the union that exists between the killing couple. Nathan Matthews is now serving a life term for murder. Shona Hoare, 17 years for manslaughter. They're no longer a couple.